Can we just get ideas when we're out of ideas? That's what we'll talk about today. No matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world. Robin Williams. And it's true. Ideas do change the world. When we think of something in a new way we never thought of before, a solution to a problem no one ever thought of. Unfortunately, we see so many ideas that are bad ideas, old ideas, they get battered around and resurrect themselves. And now I've been old enough to see a few times where ideas that I thought were in the ground suddenly come back to haunt us again. But how can we get new and fresh ideas to help improve our lives? And we're going to talk about this through the book called How to Get Ideas by Jack Foster. The book itself sounded interesting. And I think the reason it appealed to me is I see people run out of ideas. They get stuck into a problem and they just can't think of the next thing to do. What do you do when you get that kind of stuck? Ideas are something that, again, can help us out of a situation where we think we're out of ideas, we're out of suggestions. For now, this is a pretty good strength of mine. I'm really good at generating ideas. If someone presents a problem to me, I'm pretty good with thinking of something. I didn't used to be this way. When I was in high school, there was this competition to get some sort of experiment on the space shuttle. And I sat there for a month. Just think of an idea. One idea. And I sat and thought and I thought and I thought. No idea came to mind. I couldn't think of anything. And then when I saw the other students in school who won that competition, they were pretty simple ideas. And they were good ideas, like growing a bean in space to see if the roots magically know which way to grow. Putting a goldfish in space to see if the goldfish understood how to swim in a zero gravity situation. Oh, those are great ideas. There were some other really good ones too. So it confounded me a little bit about how do you get ideas? And if you feel stuck and and you feel like you can't solve some of your problems, not because maybe you think they're unsolvable or not because you're not willing to work to solving the problem if you could just think of what it is you're supposed to do, I think that this book is the one that's for you. He says that new ideas are the wheels of progress. And without them, we get stagnant. We get stuck into the same place. It doesn't matter if we're designing clothes, being an engineer, working on new software or even just trying to get people in your organization to do something, maybe getting yourself to do something too. And we live in this unique time where a wealth of information is at our very fingertips all the time. We have abilities to draw, produce, make videos, come up with ideas, research something, more than any human being in the history of mankind has had. And he says if we don't take that wealth of information that we have and turn it into something, we're wasting ideas. He says, too, that it's hard to identify what an idea is, but he says that the second we see a good idea, we recognize it. We feel it. Ooh, there's a good idea. Or that sometimes it's so simple, we wonder why we didn't think about it ourselves, kind of like my science experiment I never thought of. And so it's really just taking this combination of thoughts Bits of things that we know, combining them into something. He gives a quote from James Webb Young. An idea is nothing more or less than a new combination of old elements. And I think that that's exactly right. You have the wealth of information, of wisdom that have come through the ages. Now we take them with our new problem, with our new thinking, with the new tools we have available to us, and rework them out and piece them together into something brand new. We have to think about gathering that information. And then he says that in this book that James Webb Young wrote called A Technique for Producing Ideas, he said the second idea is is a process of mastication of those materials, meaning we're going to chew them up, let them roll around in our brain for a while, And then hopefully when we spit them out, they'll come in as a new idea. And then he says the third idea is you drop it for a while. Get it out of your head. Stop thinking about it. And then when you're least thinking about it, suddenly the new idea will pop out of nowhere. And that's because I think we gave our brain that time to mull around and think about it. 
talked a little bit about that in the John Cleese book about creativity. He says, now, once we have our little idea, our brand new idea, we have to actually put it in the world of reality. I think that fifth one is a huge problem for most people. We get this idea that we think we know how to solve a problem. And we're like, oh, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to solve world hunger. And then you realize it doesn't match the test of reality. Doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Maybe not. But it maybe needs refining. It needs some offshoots to come from that idea that would produce into actionable work. For an idea to be worthwhile, we actually have to have it be real, have it be something that we can put into action. A lot of times, I think we live in a utopian brain set. I heard someone talking today about Thomas More, who was the person that Henry VIII killed because he wouldn't sign on to his divorce. But he was a fantastic thinker, a very dedicated man to God. And he had a thing against utopian societies. But I started thinking about it when I was mowing my lawn listening to this podcast. I have a problem with utopian societies, too. They just don't work. And the problem is, is when they don't work, the people who came up with the idea thinks there's something wrong with society. There's something wrong with people. We didn't implement it correctly. Problem is, maybe with that idea in the sense that the goal was great, but it was not something we could implement ever. It was just never going to work with real human beings. Sometimes you see people come up through universities and other places where they come up with a fantastic idea. Here's how we're going to cure housing, or here's how we're going to fix this, or we're going to fix that. And then I look at some of the papers and I think, have you met people? You know, this is not how people work. And even if you can find a few people who work like this, not everyone wants to work like this. So that fifth thing about putting it into the real world and making it realistic, maybe what we're missing today, because we have all the information, we have all this time to ruminate on, and we come up with a bunch of cures and solution for things, now it has to go through that fifth test of being realistic to implement. He gives a number of systems in place for how you come up with new ideas. And it always starts out with this preparation. We gain our material. We collect the thing that we want to read to fix the solution that we're having. Then we're going to let it kind of mull around in us. We're going to plot about it. We're going to think about it. He says we're going to look for inspiration about it. And then another book he gave was called The Predator of the Universe by Charles S. Wakefield. We will come to a saturation of the problem, the factual data surrounding it. And then we come to a period where that idea incubates. We start getting a calm about it because now we think we found a way around it. And then in that book, it said there's a fifth, which is the explosion, which is boom, the idea comes alive. So this variety of different paths and systems that this book gives is pretty good when it comes to ideas. But what can we do now to make them more real? And he refines the entire system with define the problem, gather information, search for the idea, and then forget about it for a while. We said we want to incubate it for a while and then put it into action. Find that realistic thing. It's good to have that childlike innocence because children can see the world in a way we can't. It's it's something we lost. He gives a quote from Neil Postman. Children enter school as question marks and leave as periods, meaning they used to question everything and see the world around them. And some point, they become periods. What I said, end of sentence. That's it. This is the end of the idea. This is what's going to work. It may not be true. So how can we get back to taking what we know and understanding our learning and turn it back into question marks? So again, we question everything. We talked about that in previous podcasts. How can we look at things from a new light, question our assumptions, and put question marks at the end of every sentence so that we can Explore that maybe we're not thinking about something we should be thinking about. And as soon as we're there, as soon as we at least understand the problem we're trying to solve, he gives a quote from Arthur Kostler, the mere knowledge that a problem is solvable means half the game is already won. If we know we can solve it, 
we determined through our learning and our digging around that we can figure out a way. First of all, it makes you feel a lot better because you know there's a way out. But secondly, you know there's a path out. There's a way that you can do something about whatever it is you're trying to change. He says that in the end, our self-image is has more to do with how we perform on these problems that we have or thinking about ideas. He says it's not effort. It's not willpower. It's not any of the things that you think success is. He thinks it's self-image, giving the Henry Ford quote, and I've always loved this quote, whatever you think, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Because your attitude is going to mean everything. I'm just never going to find another job. You're right. You're never going to find another job. At least not thinking like that, you're not. And if you don't go about changing your attitude, Telling yourself that other story, like we talked about last week, you're just going to be in the same situation because you don't think you can solve the problem. And if you think you can solve the problem, even if it's an unsolvable problem, you're a lot closer to understanding how to solve the problem if you think you can. So you got to get, he says, your idea of how you're thinking and think differently. He says that there's a mantra, quote, tell yourself every day that you're a fount of ideas that ideas bubble forth from you like water from a spring every day. No, many times a day. Eventually, you'll begin living up to this new mental image you've created for yourself. So start to believe that you can do this, that you can think of ideas. You can get out whatever situation you're in. And it's going to take effort, but you're ready for it. And you know you're ready for it. So that's where you have to change your thinking. He gives this thought image, and it's kind of a really interesting and weird one, but imagine there's a beam, and someone says, I want you to walk across the beam, and you're like, oh, I am not walking across that beam. There is no way I can walk across that beam. And then this imaginary person puts a baby at the end of the beam, and suddenly you're walking across the beam, grabbing the baby, and probably doing a really good job of it without thinking how horrible this is. And he said the thing that changed was the end goal. The first end goal was walking across a beam we didn't care about walking across. The second was saving a baby. Our reaction to this situation is because the goal changed, the task changed. So sometimes, too, if you can't change your thinking about the intermediate steps that you need to do to solve whatever problem you're having, maybe you have to change what the goal is. In my sense, I thought, I have to save my retirement. I have to get in my peace of mind that I'm not going to eat dirt for the rest of my life. And I have many years left in the work world. I want to be happy too. So instead of thinking about jobs as, well, if I make this pay and this thing, and I could have nerded out in the whole math of what a new job means, instead, my goal became different. I want to be happy. I want to know that I'm going to be okay in retirement. That was my two goals. It helped me see clear to a new way of thinking. He says, too, we have to visualize. Visualization is an important way of creating whatever new ideas we have. And imagine, not just of of us thinking and planning. Oh, we imagine in our brain of us thinking of that right idea. Imagine that the goal is over with. We're done with the project, whatever it is. And this new idea we had saved the day. Everyone's patting you on the back. What a good idea. You really thought through this. Once you start thinking through the end of things or talking past the solution, you'll be able to fit into that line much better. He worries that some of us are in a rut. Of course, we get into ruts. Everybody gets into ruts because we start finding like a good path in our life. We have this for breakfast and we do this with our friends and we feel like our lives are in a good spot because we have sort of everything in its place. But he says he knows in the end, you're in a rut. And maybe that's why you're not coming up with new ideas, because you're not challenged to think about new ideas. And so he suggests taking up anything that's creative, that's new, getting out of the rut. Because once you're out of that rut, new ideas will be easier to think about. And he says we'll have to get out of our ruts a little bit of work every day. This is something that we're going to work on to become more creative, and making ideas better than ever, more easily available to us every day. So my challenge to you 
is just let yourself ruminate on a problem you're having. Don't go in there thinking about solutions. Don't go out there and think about the real world during this time, but just kind of noodle around this idea. Boy, what am I going to do in order to get that relationship to work right? Spin it around in your brain. Do what they say. Masticate on it. And then forget it for a while and see what comes out the other side. Maybe your problem is on its way to being solved. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And if you wouldn't mind telling a friend, letting someone know about this podcast, I'd appreciate it. And remember, our walk to living a life filled with ideas starts with small steps. Small steps.